So I wanted to talk a little bit about the numbers. I think we all know that for people with dementia, we are seeing more and more folks in our population experiencing signs of dementia, one form or another. And we know that this will continue to increase as well. And I believe that for every one person that's affected by Alzheimer disease or related dementia, there's another seven to 10 people that are also affected as family members, as caregivers and friends of these folks. We do know as well, I think oftentimes we believe that dementia is really just for people over the age of 65 or 70 or 80, and unfortunately that's not the case. There are one out of um, six people under the age of 65 that also are experiencing signs of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And if we live to the ripe old age of 85, unfortunately we do have a one in three chance of developing Alzheimer's disease or a form of dementia as well. Um, one person out of that three would have Alzheimer's, one would have uh, normal aging, and one would just be sort of mild cognitive impairment, so some early, really early signs of dementia. So dementia and Alzheimer's disease, I kind of tend to use them interchangeably, but really they're not. It is a very common question that we receive as well as what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? So I just want to explain a little bit of that in that dementia is really just a set of symptoms. So it includes memory loss and it includes that changes in personality, changes in understanding and changes in judgment. And all of these things start to affect our functioning level as well. So dementia can be a number of different diseases. Alzheimer's disease is really just one form of dementia. It is the most common form of dementia and the one that we see and hear the most about. Vascular dementia is a form caused by a multiple strokes, and those strokes could be happening over a number of years. They can be very small. We don't even know we're experiencing them, but gradually we start to notice that there are some changes that look a lot like Alzheimer's disease. We are also seeing a mixed dementia, which is actually vascular dementia as well as Alzheimer's disease, sort of going hand in hand. Lewy body dementia is a little bit different as well. There is some... Um, Physical changes that happen with Lewy body as well, people tend to have some very, very vivid hallucinations. So hallucinations that are very real to them. They can see things or hear things that, um, that are not there, obviously. The rest of us can't see them, um, but they can be very vivid and very frightening for that individual. And then frontal temporal dementia, lastly, is another form of dementia. It's not as um, common. However, we are seeing this kind of disease happening earlier in a person's life, so usually before 65. And in this one, it's a little bit more challenging to diagnose because the person's memory is often quite um, intact, quite good early on, but they're having other behavior and personality changes that are, um, that are kind of hard to explain for someone that may still be working and still raising their family and kind of getting kids off to university and those sorts of things. So these are the progressive neurodegenerative diseases. They are irreversible. So once the damage starts, it does continue to progress. However, dementia can also be reversible. So I really just encourage that if you are having some challenges or you're just maybe thinking, mm, something's not quite right, or I'm just maybe having some problems with my memory, we need to look at some of the, what those reversible causes are. So we often think of the three Ds with older adults, so dementia, delirium, and depression. So depression it is a metabolic illness. Um, it can be fairly successfully treated um, using some antidepressants. So that can be a real boon for that individual that once that medication has started, they almost see that some of that forgetfulness and confusion starts to reverse, and that's a really good positive thing. And delirium as well is a medical emergency um, it's really a very sudden onset for someone who may already have a compromised cognitive function and all of a sudden they just seem really, really confused or um, really having a lot of difficulties. And in an older adult, that may actually be related just to a urinary tract infection. So once that treatment has started, the anti uh, antibiotic becomes more effective, um, they, you may again see them reverting back to sort of their original or sort of their normal functioning. So kind of being aware of that depression delirium, also being aware of medications. We all tend to have some sort of medication that we take, especially as we grow older. So making sure that those medications are still the right meds for us. Um, nutritional disorders, 
um, quite often in our work that we do, we would see someone that's living on their own. Um, so, you know, for lunch, they're having tea and toast and for breakfast, they had tea and toast and, and you know, but we, we had something to eat. You know, that's often what we'll hear our older adults tell our adult children. Um, but then they move into long-term care or even into just a retirement home. And now we're seeing that that person is getting their meals on time. They're having more than tea and toast. They're having their medications given to them in the right amount at the right time. So in that real routine and families then say, oh my gosh, maybe I should take my mom back home because she's doing so much better, but she's doing better because we have that routine in place and we have those supports. So just being aware that nutritional disorders can be a real barrier um, for people to continue to do well um, as they're aging and perhaps experiencing some memory problems as well. So with regards to dementia, there are those reversible causes as well as the irreversible ones. So when I was asked to do this presentation, I was asked to focus a little bit on the warning signs. And in the bags at the front of the stage there, there is um, more information around the warning signs and a bigger explanation about the dementias as well. Um, but I just wanted to focus on the 10 most common warning signs. So it is memory loss that affects day-to-day -day function. And I think oftentimes that we hear, you know, Alzheimer's disease is just memory loss. Oh, I'm just having memory problems, so that must mean I just have Alzheimer's disease. But it's really so much more. Alzheimer's really affects our whole functioning ability. Um, but typically early on, especially, it is for short-term memory problems. Um, but that does progress uh, to longer-term memories as well. We may also see some difficulty performing familiar tasks. So things like, you know, using a recipe, um, perhaps it's something that you've been able to do, it's your sort of family favorite, you don't need to follow the recipe anymore, but now you're starting to notice that things just don't taste quite right because maybe we didn't follow the right order of things. So things um, that are very familiar to that individual, you might see that they are having more difficulties performing those tasks. Early on as well, we can see that the person may have some difficulties with language. So we all have sort of that, um, those moments where we can't find our right word um, or we don't use it the right way. However, for people with an early sign of Alzheimer's disease, we're going to see that happening more frequently. Those words really are lost um, or they're substituting words that maybe sound the same but don't necessarily have the same meaning. So car, cat, they sound similar, um, but obviously if you're using them in a sentence, then they're not going to have the same understanding. So problems with language can be really um, early signs of dementia and it's really, really frustrating for the person with the disease as well that they're sort of losing their thoughts mid-sentence and not able to get back to them, needing a little bit more time to be able to respond. As well, we might see some difficulties with disorientation to time and place. So that could be in a very familiar setting. I mean, someone that has early onset Alzheimer's disease that came into this setting at the plowing match would be probably pretty overwhelmed if they weren't able to find their loved one or um, got, you know, sort of separated from them because it's pretty unfamiliar for most of us. Um, however, we may see someone, you know, even just getting lost on their own street because all of a sudden those familiar landmarks become unfamiliar. They're not able to remember those landmarks. We also might see poor or decreased judgment. So perhaps making inappropriate decisions with regards to some business activities that they might be involved in. We might also just see, um, I think of one gentleman that decided he needed a new truck. So off he went and purchased a brand new truck and signed on the dotted line and brought his new truck home and his wife was beside herself because how were they gonna get out of this contract? He had already lost his license because he had frontal temporal dementia. So you can think of those things that are those really poor decision-making abilities um, that tend to increase as the person progresses through dementia. As well, um, the sixth most common warning sign is problems with abstract thinking. So for example, looking at a checkbook, not necessarily knowing how to balance it, but also not even really sure what those numbers mean. So it becomes much more abstract um, and much more difficult for the person to manage. We may also see misplacing things. So quite often people in the early signs tell us that I just am spending a lot of my time looking for things all of the time. So putting things in you know, safe places never to be found again, um, or you know, lettuce in the fridge, or sorry, lettuce in the freezer, or bags in um, the fridge, you know, just really odd things that are happening. 
So they spend a lot of time looking for things. And again, that can be very frustrating for the person. We might also see that there's some changes in mood and behavior. So again, they may have been very easygoing most of their life, and, um, and now things are really setting them off. Um, they're getting quite upset or really angry, and those changes can happen pretty quickly. And again, it's something that's different. It's not a normal behavior for that person, but more of a, a significant change. And some of that change in personality as well. You know, again, maybe they've been really an energetic person and you're finding that they tend to withdraw a bit more from activities or, you know, instead of being involved in a committee that's preparing for this event, which is something they would have loved to do in the past, they're now saying, yeah, no, I'm not really interested in doing that. So you see those changes that are happening in that individual. And oftentimes a loss of initiative as well. So quite often we'll see people that do withdraw. Um, they tend just not to be as engaged as they used to be. Um, they need some more difficulty sort of getting up and getting that idea and getting going. So some of that loss of initiative can be a real challenge for people. So hopefully this kind of just gives you a real idea that it's not just memory loss when people are experiencing this disease, but there's many other things that are being affected as well. So these are just some hallmark signs of the disease and I thought I would show you them because oftentimes when we have had maybe a broken leg or we've had some surgery, we're not expected to do everything um, that we did before sort of that injury or that procedure. Um, but our brain is changing and our brain is changing and we can't see it until during autopsy. So, or I mean, really we could see it during MRI and PET scan and those sorts of things, but it's not a real sort of let's see what's happening. So as family and as friends, we need to realize that there are physical changes that are happening in the brain that are causing all of these warning signs and we have to change our expectations as well. So these are plaques and tangles that you can see there. Um, and here we have a healthy brain versus a brain that is taken from a woman that was in her early 70s and died of Alzheimer's disease and then was autopsied through the Centre for Research at the University of Toronto. So you can see obvious changes. Those plaques and tangles have actually caused the brain to shrink fairly significantly over a period of time. And of course, each part of the brain is really responsible for different functions. So Alzheimer's disease can affect each lobe. And if I just go back to this slide here for a sec, each of the lobes in it are in a different color and they all have different responsibilities. So Alzheimer's disease can affect each part of that brain. And so that's why it always looks a little bit different for people as well. We always say that if you've seen one person with Alzheimer's disease, you've seen one person. Yes, there's similarities, there's stages people may go through, there's symptoms that they may experience or they may not experience depending on where that damage is happening. So I'll just scoot through here. This is my um, most recent sort of new picture and I think it's great because it is taken from a live person and it's comparing that normal brain on the left and the brain affected by Alzheimer's disease on the right so what we're looking at is the changes in the blue and the black. So the normal brain, there's less blue and black. The person that has Alzheimer's disease, we're seeing more blue and black, which is less activity in those areas. So we can see that the brain is having some real physical changes. And just a quote by Oliver Sacks, that it is our brain that gives us our experience of the world. We are what we are because of our experiences is our experiences and our perceptions. So how do we help at the Alzheimer's Society? Um, we believe that people have the right to have as much information about their diagnosis as possible and that it really is better for them to be diagnosed as early as possible so that they can get the care and the support that they need as well as medications. There are some treatments available and for people that um, have that treatment earlier on, it tends to help them stay longer in the earlier stages where they're still able to function fairly independently. So we believe it really is important for them to be informed of their diagnosis. So with the Alzheimer's Society, we offer a program called First Link. And the goal of First Link is to connect people with dementia and their families to information, education, and support in their own communities. So across Ontario, there are 36 chapters. We in Perth County are just one. So I just encourage that if you're not from this area, but you do have some concerns, that you can just go online even to www.alzheimer.ca and you can find the chapter that's closest to you. 
Um, I think it's as well a privilege that we have the opportunity to see people very early in their disease, perhaps even before diagnosis, and then follow them throughout that disease and support them throughout that process. Um, for our chapter, we have just celebrating our 25 years and we're excited about that. Um, we do have some funding sources through the LIN, which is our government funding, but as well, in order to keep our doors open, we still have to fundraise 37% of our budget and we do that through um, things like the bucket day that we had the opportunity to do on Wednesday here at the plowing match, as well as soups on. We're also in the midst of our na national coffee break campaign. So lots of different events happen throughout the year in an effort to help um, continue to provide services for those that require the support and information. We are proud to say that the funds that we raise in Perth County do stay in Perth County, so you can remember that if you're donating to us as well. So things that we do to help people with dementia and their families. If a person comes to us and says, I have some concerns about my memory, I'm not really sure where to go, and my doctor's maybe not really supportive of the fact that I'm really worried. So we could do some memory screening. We may also sort of give them a sort of a nudge to go back to their doctor and say, this is sort of the results of that screening. We would also send those results on to the family physician to say, this is what we've discovered. These are the concerns and this is what the testing says. So that's working with our community partners. Um, we would also make referrals to CCAC or the Alzheimer's Day program or Meals and Wheels, any of the other community services out there that can support our clients. We will continue to provide support and information to the person with dementia and their family as long as they're open to receiving that information. So for some, it's a long time. Um, I'm working with a number of families that when I first came to the chapter almost six years ago, I had the privilege of seeing them in their very early stages of the disease and we're still providing that support to both um, parties, the person with disease as well as their family. So that support could look like regular phone calls. It might be information sort of strategizing. You know, these are behaviors that we're seeing. What are some techniques? What are some things that we could do to maybe minimize those behaviors or help the person cope? Um, we would also provide some family counseling. And very early on, sometimes that's really helpful is just to kind of bring all the family members together to say, these are the challenges. This is what your family members struggling with. These are some ways that we think they could use some help. How can you get involved? And what can your role be in this? Because it really is a whole family um, that needs to take care of this one person with dementia. We provide ongoing support groups for people with the disease as well as for their caregivers. And we have a number of groups that happen throughout Perth County. And we're just looking at starting a brand new group for those that are in their very early stages. We actually have a number of women that live in the north part of Perth County that have just kind of really recently received their diagnosis. And we have certainly enough ladies that we're hoping to have a morning coffee group. So that again, that's the other piece is that we can sort of be um, creative and offer the support that people need when they need it. We also offer a Medic Alert Safely Home program. This is a national program. It's a fabulous idea just to register your person with dementia in case they do go missing or get lost. Um, again, we hope it never happens, that they never need it. Um, but because we're connected with Medic Alert, um, it is a national program. So if you're traveling from here to BC, you can still access your information through Medic Alert or you're a snowbird and you go to the States they can still access the information there as well. And there's some identification packages that go along with the program too, so that um, if the person does happen to go missing, then we have sort of tools already in place. We're being proactive instead of reactive. And I know families always say, oh, my loved one's not a wanderer. Oh, they're not gonna get lost. Unfortunately, it happens in the blink of an eye. Um, we do continue to provide education, so different sessions such as this out in the community. As well, we have ongoing learning series that we offer to families as well early on to people with dementia as well. And we provide a lot of support to our long-term care staff, um, homes, partners there in different sessions and opportunities, workshops that we have to support them in their work as well. And we're just launching our volunteer companion program. 
So if you're interested in doing some more volunteering or getting involved in, with our organization, we would just encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, the volunteer would be matched, first of all, screened and trained appropriately, and then matched with a person that has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, so that they can go into the home, spend some time with them in their own home while the caregiver has a break. And especially as the disease progresses, that break is a really important piece of keeping that person at home for as long as possible. In our role, we also provide a lot of client advocacy. So sometimes it's just noticing that things are changing. Maybe it's time we start to get some more services in place and, and you know, making that phone call to CCAC or to the family physician or whatever that service might be so we can provide some of that role as well. And we do have a lending library that works both um, out of both of our offices, which is Listowel as well as the Stratford office. And I did bring some information and some resources that are, are at our exhibit. And our exhibit is in the Perth County Services tent. So if you feel free to visit us before you go as well. So um, just to kind of wrap up, I just really want to encourage that if you're noticing changes in yourself or in your family member, that you do have that conversation with your doctor just so we can rule out anything that might be reversible, anything that could be causing those memory problems or behavior changes. And certainly if you're not feeling like you have a really good relationship with your doctor or that you just really want some more information before you go that route, I just really would encourage you to call the Alzheimer's Society no matter where you live. Um, we are here to help. Our motto is help for today and hope for tomorrow. And we hope that everyone that needs our services finds us um, because we do know from families that have already experienced uh, sort of that support that we can offer that it's way better to go through it with someone than to be alone. And I think so many times we hear families say, you know, I'm going through this journey, I had no idea what sort of support was out there, and it's so much better to hear from others as well that I am not alone and that there is someone else that truly understands the challenges that we're facing as a family. If you or someone you know could benefit from the services at the Alzheimer Society, or if you'd like to get involved and become a volunteer, please visit your local Alzheimer Society.